so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. If you're missing your weekly out loud routine over the break, we wanted to let you know that we are still dropping episodes for Mamma Mia subscribers. So you can get full access to Out Loud, including the back catalogue of over 150 subscriber only episodes. Subscribe to Mamma Mia via the link in the episode description. Hello, Out Louders. It's Holly Wainwright here. Look, Jesse, Mia, and I are currently on our summer break, and I am busy writing, trying to race to a book deadline, and spend as much time with my kids in the sunshine as I can. I hope you are having a wonderful summer wherever you are. While we are off, we thought that we would revisit some of our favorite conversations and topics from 2023. Maybe you missed them, maybe you'd like to relive them too. And so we are playing some of them through our feed throughout the summer. We hope that you enjoy this best of episode of Mamma Mia Out Loud. Mamma Mia Out Loud! Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Have you ever experienced something that should have been one of your happiest moments? A birthday party, your wedding, a holiday, and found that the reality is just not working out like you expected. It's being called perfect moment syndrome, and basically it refers to the gap between expectation and reality in some of your happiest moments. It afflicts those of us who think life should operate in a certain way and to certain ratios, that birthdays are always happy, that a week in Thailand is meant to be relaxing, that a long-awaited date with your partner at a special restaurant will bring you closer together. So the term was coined by author Sarah Wilson, and it's hit a chord with a lot of people on TikTok. TikTok, who are talking about how it affects their relationships, holidays, formals, basically anything in their lives that should feel good but just does not. Experts are weighing in on perfect moment syndrome, with some pointing out that people can be scarred by traumatic histories where bad things were shown to naturally follow good things, so anxiety or distress is a natural reaction to things going well. But it can also come down to black and white thinking, disproportionate expectations, and a lack of understanding of what will truly make you happy in any given situation. Claire, as somebody who has never deeply examined the concept of happiness or moments of disappointment and also never launched a chart-topping podcast about this literal exact topic. (laughs) What are your thoughts on perfect moment syndrome and have you ever had it? I love this concept because it's essentially what my podcast, But Are You Happy, is about. And we ask ask guests for a time the world told them they'd be happy and they weren't. And the answers are always fascinating. I think Instagram slash social media has a huge part to play in this because the idea of flattening life experiences to an image is something I don't think we've explored enough, the impact that that has on our expectations and on how we expect things to be emotionally. Like the influencer who was in Europe. This occurred to me immediately (laughs) as well. I was like, guys, there's like cues and there's rubbish on the street. And it's like, yeah, because the beautiful image that you've seen, that's a 360 actual living, breathing moment. That's not just a flat image. So I've had lots of these moments, which is what inspired the podcast and why I was interested in this topic. At the moment, for example, I have always looked forward to pregnancy. I look to people like Meghan Markle holding her bump at those awards. Remember, like everyone made fun of her, Mm. but I was like, I don't know, I'd love to hold my bump. I hate pregnancy. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Probably the biggest Mm. example was Jesse's wedding day. So it was something I looked forward to my entire life and then I was sick, which is something that happens in life, is that sometimes those moments, they just don't happen or they just don't work out the way that you think. perfect moment syndrome? Maybe I've misunderstood what it is. I thought it was about not because you cry because you're disappointed that it's not what you'd hoped that it would be, but more that feeling of... I'll often cry in happy moments and it's always connected to a loss because with a lot of milestone happy moments like your child's wedding, for example, Mm. I cried with happiness but also because I was crossing a threshold into him, you know, that next phase of life Mm. into letting go and stepping back and, and on my daughter's last day of school. I was so happy but I was also very emotional because 
there was also a letting go and a sort of a looking back. To me, it's the nostalgia of tearfulness, not of Mm. mismatched expectations. Is that different to perfect moment syndrome? I think it might be because Mm. I think that what you're describing is where you're living in a moment and you're able to like reflect seriously Mm. on the implications of that moment. Whereas I think that perfect moment syndrome more reflects a kind of delusion, the mismatch between reality and what your expectations are. Or our lack of understanding that like the way life works is that even the most perfect day of your life is going to have disappointments and even the crappiest day of your life is going to have silver linings. Like yeah. like it's sort of that really yeah. black and white, all or nothing thinking that means that when we get to these moments, and I think it's just especially true of young people, that, you know, you get to your wedding day or you get to your year 12 formal and you think that it's going to be this absolutely perfect Thing and it's absolutely not because nothing is. Do you think that's why a lot of people feel very sad on Christmas Day? Mm. You can never yeah. recapture if you had a good Christmas when you're a kid. You can never recapture the joy of that. It's always a disappointment, particularly when you have to sort of and I do think all it's, the work. Yeah. I and I think that Christmas Day is like the pinnacle of Christmas time. So it's like you've got this whole season <laughs> that's building up to a day, and then you get you wake up on the day and you're like, I'm tired and cranky do you know what I mean like like you're kind of faced with the reality that like this is not magic this is just life I think the other part of this and and I spoke to um Hugh Van Kylenberg about this in an episode of but are you happy is this idea of life seasoned which you guys have spoken about on this podcast and we sort of expect life seasons to be either completely happy or completely not and there are people who look Mm. at a particular life season and anticipate, for example, it's a big reason for postnatal depression that people look at, you know, I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to be the happiest I've ever been. And that's a huge thing that then plays into the mental health issues that can arise. I was talking to Hugh Van Kylenberg about this and the fact that, you know, I was like, but what about when you just absolutely hate it and I'm only pregnant because I want a baby and I actually hate this phase? He had some beautiful lines about in your favourite book, there will be chapters you don't like and in your favourite chapter there will be sentences you don't like Mm. and also in the crappest chapter of a book there will be great sentences. Like you've really got to kind of play with that nuance of like having gratitude for goodness in bad times and appreciating that in the best times, the most magical times, there are going to be imperfections. Elfie, can you think of times that you've had perfect moment syndrome? I don't think that this is something that troubles me because I have very low expectations (laughs) of a lot of things. Cynicism is great. (laughs) But I have to say that my partner has been very good at getting me to voice when I am feeling discomfort that is putting me in a grump. Mm. And I think being able to pinpoint that and laugh at it because ultimately it's always going to be like it was a good day but it was very windy yeah (laughs) it's like it really makes you laugh at yourself and how unbelievably fickle you can be when you are just in a cranky mood and I think that that can really interrupt a good day but I really love that idea Claire because I think that a lot of this is also just about relinquishing control and not being perfectionist and yeah having a very realistic idea of what the world and life is like Birthdays have felt like that to me. I've now managed to remove all my expectations for birthdays after having so many terrible, terrible birthdays. Happy birthday. Like, And it's like you're meant to feel, I don't know mm. what, I always feel like I'm getting my feelings wrong on my birthday. Yeah, yeah. Like I think it's that you feel like your own emotions can never live up to what they're meant to. Yeah. On but a then certain... where does the meant to come from? I don't from? know. Is it what we digest in I think movies it's or social media? Yeah, I think it everyone's is performative. Performative. Yeah. <laughs> is everyone performing birthdays? I think they are. Yeah, it's a weird thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone, I don't know what you're meant to feel on your birthday. I've never felt it. I also, on those big moments where you're meant to feel a lot, I'm always paralysed with nothing, with just numbness. Like the day I got engaged, each of the days I had my babies, I never felt that I was feeling what I was meant to feel. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I don't know what I was meant to feel, but it, that wasn't it. And to me, my happiest times, that was not any special occasion, but I had all my family over 
you know, someone was holding Luna and the kids were teasing each other and laughing and someone was in the kitchen and it was like my heart was so full in that moment, but it was like I had no expectations for that exactly. night. But I think that you're also tapping into this idea that we are so built to believe that our moments of happiness should be moments of ecstatic joy. And I think actually what happiness boils down to is contentment, right? Mm. Mm. And that heart full feeling. And it's not like it's going to feel like fireworks. A lot of the time it will just feel like fulfillment. Out loud is come into the Facebook group and let us know when you've had perfect moment syndrome. We want to know the moment, why it didn't live up to expectations and how you've sort of processed it afterwards. Mama Mia out loud. I came across an article in Cosmopolitan called There's a Dark Side to the Online Gossip Mill. I would know. I'm the brains behind Dermois. For those who aren't aware, Dermois is an anonymous Instagram account that publishes celebrity gossip. It has 1.9 million followers. It started as a fashion Ooh, that's focused. A lot. By the way, that's a lot. It's I a lot. might be one of them. Are you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Shh. Everyone I know is one. It started as a fashion focused page. And then during the pandemic, the account asked followers to share stories about celebrities. It would then post screenshots of the direct messages that people had sent in with stories of celebrity encounters and shared them for all the followers to see, and it's grown from there. It's now turned into a fully-fledged brand and business. There's a newsletter, a novel, well, not really a novel, but it was called A Non-Please, a podcast, and collaborations with other media. Importantly, the bio of the Dermois Instagram account says, Some statements made on this account have not been independently confirmed. This account does not claim information published is based on fact. So the anon please that you mentioned, the way it works is that you can email to this email address gossip. Anon please is when people say don't Don't use my name, name. obviously. And they just literally screenshot it and share it. It is gossip in its most pure form. You think they make editorial decisions about like, not that one, yes, this one. Like as in that sounds too outrageous. That one's not about someone anyone cares about. They've said that there are certain things that they steer away from. There's a lot of things that I come across that are litigious that have to do with celebrities and I pass those off. I pass those off to real reporters. So some recent stories from Dermois have been the Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet dating story that came from them. Jennifer Coolidge. Turned out to be true. Yep. Jennifer Coolidge apparently trashes hotel rooms. There's just a bit of anonymous Hush gossip. Your mouth. I know. Courtney and Kim aren't speaking. They are fighting. So it sounds legit. Mm. And Euphoria is getting cancelled because it's just chaos on set. So it's like the new gossip magazine. And you know when you read it, there's a good chance that what you're reading isn't true, but it's just so juicy. And I think there's a real ethical dilemma with that because you don't know which ones are true and which ones aren't. The article I read was about being Dermois and anxieties around getting doxxed and how personal safety is Who there. is the person? Is it a she? And we, also what's yes. doxxed? Doxxed means having your personal information out, published out it. online. Oh, and you mean so, people gossiping about yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the person who runs it is like, oh, my gosh, like that could ruin my career. Because she's anonymous? Yes. And she in this article she's like, my dad told his friend and I didn't speak to him for a week. The person who runs Dermois says their primary concern is safety because the internet and especially Instagram can be a really scary place. <sighs> like the Swifties, for example, they're not happy with her no, often. No, no. I read this with my mouth hanging open in shock because I couldn't get over the irony. Being so scared about what people on the internet might find out about you when you have built a business sharing unverified information about celebrities. I think it generally about similar gossip accounts and podcasts. There's ones in Australia. Holly, you exploited celebrities for a living. Do you think it's fair for Dermois to be concerned about their own safety? Oh, yikesy. That's a really good question. Holly worked in gossip mags out loud as who and you. I did. When I did work in Gossip Max, actually, one day when I was working at Woman's Day, the chaser did a stunt where they sent paparazzi to stake out the editor's house. So this is not a new idea, this kind of like, you want to do it to us, we'll do it Mm. to you kind Mm. of thing. 
But I think it's really interesting because Dumois is just an evolution of what we've always been doing. And is it grubby? Is it wrong? Yes. Can you legislate for what people are interested in? No. People like to know what public people do in private. It's not nice, but they do. And when I worked in gossip mags, we had sources. Some of them were actual sources, like family members sometimes, like people very close to people, and some of them were bullshit made up sources. Some of them were the celebrities themselves. Yes, definitely. And in the US in particular, it's a whole industry. Like the sources are security guards and doormen and the receptionists in the medical building and waiters and people who clean hotel rooms. And they supplement their probably pretty crappy wages by selling gossip to the tabloids. This is just that, except the people who are sending their stories to Dumois are not getting paid, I assume. Mm. So the motivation is just like, does that make it better or worse? I know something. But I think it's really obviously ethically dangerous because even if gossip seems a little harmless, it can entirely change a reputation. I often think about James Corden and how Claire and Jesse ruined his reputation on Cancelled <laughs> when they <laughs> widely surfaced that gossip about him on a plane not being very nice to his mother of his baby in first class or whatever. Nobody knows if that's true. But that one anecdote has the power to completely change the way you view that person. Those kind of bits of gossip that aren't necessarily someone's cheating or somebody's, you know, got a drug habit or whatever, but are just more like they're not very nice are actually the most damaging ones. And that's kind of crazy. What's interesting about Dumois is that the business model is very tenuous. So unlike Perez Hilton, the gossip columnist from... TMZ? It was his own brand. He Mm. started in the early 2000s. You know, that was more like a gossip magazine, but online it was sort of the first one like that. But he sold advertising and that was a business model. He sold advertising around it. Dumois, obviously you can't sell advertising on Instagram, but the Dumois brand has worldwide recognition and means something. It means probably what Perez Hilton used to mean then and what Women's Day or New Idea used to mean in the 90s, a byline for gossip. So the way that she's tried to monetize that is by writing a book and having a podcast podcast. and selling merch and stuff like that. But she's never going to be able to be credible because the stuff that she publishes celebrities are always deciding whether they're going to sue or not. And I imagine she probably doesn't publish anything about Harry and Meghan. Yeah. Oh, she was talking. Actually, I listened to the most recent episode of the podcast and she was talking about Harry and Meghan and she said that she does have confirmation that Harry is not living in their house in Montecito. He is living elsewhere in LA. The idea that she is anonymous, and you're right, Claire, that when you read this piece, it's kind of infuriating how she's so shitty if her friends like let anything slip and how very dare they. And I had to cut off a whole friend group because they weren't being discreet enough. And you're a bit like, babe, come on. By holding back your identity, that means that one day you can reveal it. So you've always got it in your back pocket, which might be quite a good thing to do. It's harder for people to sue you, though. Because there's theories. Yes, it's definitely harder for people to sue you. There's theories that there's like a few people behind it and that some of them are famous people and that's how they've got certain intel. But you don't have to be a famous person. You can just leak to Dumois. The three of us can leak to Dumois. Like if I'm Taylor Swift's publicist, I can leak. And the person running the account can yeah. send themselves a message and then screenshot it and then post it and then you've got a story. So do you think, Claire Stevens, that she should be doxxed because she's made the famous people's lives really hard? She should have her life made hard too. I'm quite a moral absolutist in that, like, I don't think you ever do something bad to somebody no matter what they've done to you. So I don't think that there's anything to be gained from that. However, this really did get me thinking about this whole machine of gossip. And I I just read it and I went, I don't understand that person's motivation. I don't understand how you get up in the morning and think I am going to make somebody's life a mess. That's not what she thinks she's doing. So we've all shared gossip. The hit you get from feeling like you're telling someone something interesting that they don't know yet, that elevates your status in your social tribe. And that's what this is really. I want to know from out louders, be honest. Do you read this stuff or are you morally pure? And like Claire pretends I to be. I think you can only really criticize this stuff hard if you do not consume it. If you're clicking on those stories, if you're 
buying those magazines in the old days as I was and in fact creating them, you can't really I don't know. I think that's a very capitalist argument that is like it's the consumer's fault, whereas I just don't think it should exist in the first place. And I think with the internet and with kind of the democratisation of information and the fact that there's far more that this person can publish and with 1.9 million followers the impact is so quick and so swift, I think there's got to be some kind of way to police this stuff. My intention is to entertain and build a community and that's why I love Mamma Mia Out Loud! If you want to make Mamma Mia Out Loud part of your routine five days a week, we release segments on Tuesdays and Thursdays just for Mamma Mia subscribers. To get full access, follow the link in the show notes and a big thank you to all our current subscribers. If we go back to the definition of narcissism, it's excessive interest in or admiration of oneself and one's physical appearance. Note the word excessive, right? We all know somebody who is just posting selfies all day and you're like, how are you still going? You must not be doing anything else. Like, what are you doing anything else today? Is it narcissistic to post a photo of yourself online? This is the question that a very famous YouTuber called Emma Chamberlain posed on her podcast. And she spoke about how she has become increasingly comfortable and suddenly uncomfortable about posting photos of herself, particularly on Instagram. She's only 21 years old. She's been famous since she was in her teens. She has 12 million subscribers. So she's very firmly in the Gen Z camp. And here's a little bit of what she had to say. Recently, I've felt weird posting pictures of myself on Instagram. And I've never felt this feeling before. I've felt like a narcissist and it scared me a little bit. I've been finding myself taking a pause before I post a picture of myself, feeling almost uncertain of whether or not it's the right thing to do. I listened uh, to that and found it so interesting because I, I used to have a very tortured relationship with selfies in terms of like many people of my generation, which is Gen X, I started off when the whole selfie movement started going, oh my God, it's so narcissistic. It's ridiculous. Everyone taking photos of themselves and posting it. So vain, et cetera. And then I checked myself and I went, well, if in my former career as a magazine editor, I kept banging on about how we needed more diversity of women's faces and bodies out in the world in the imagery that we swim in, Surely everybody posting photos of themselves is the best possible thing for that. I realized that I'd internalized also a real thing about vanity and the worst thing that you can do, particularly as an Australian woman, is be vain. You know, that was certainly drummed into me at high school. You just could never be accused of being vain. That was the biggest sin you could commit. But what's interesting is that I've also noticed lately is a real difference again generationally in that Gen Z people and millennials are much more comfortable with just taking a photo of themselves and going, I look cute and just not justifying it. That's why I was surprised to hear this from Emma being only 21. Whereas people who are older millennials or Gen X, they still want to post a photo of themselves for reasons we'll get into in a second, but they always have to justify it with some reason that's more worthy. And I'll give you an example that I saw two different women, both very famous both very rich, both very beautiful, one in her late 50s, one in her late 30s, posted photos of themselves, galleries actually, like multiple photos of yourself in one post on a red carpet and they both were at the uh, Women in Science Awards and I'd not heard of that before but Elfie, you're a science journalist. I have not heard of this before. <laughs> okay, we should, have, we should have entered you. They both posted just these photos of themselves on the red carpet and their captions were almost identical. It was like, so happy to be celebrating women in science tonight at the Women of Science Awards, hashtag STEM. But there was no mention of the women in science. There were no photos of the women in science. It was basically just a justification to say, hey, look at me on a red carpet, which I can understand. A lot of time, money, effort goes into hair, makeup. One of these women was a model, so it's actually her job to be out there and do that. And I think that everybody knows the feeling of when you post a photo of yourself 
and you get nice things, compliments back, it can feel quite nice. So my question is, why do we post photos of ourselves? Is it narcissistic? Elfie. Oh, God, this is so multi-layered and I don't even know how you get into this. Like in that Emma Chamberlain episode, I noticed that she herself was running herself into like little mental circles, like she was getting caught in these little black holes of thoughts. Basically, what I would say is that there are definitely like narcissistic traits associated with posting selfies, like if you do it too much, obviously. But I also wonder like what are the really bad parts of posting selfies? Because at the end of the day, it's quite a benign activity to post a photo of yourself, right? Like it doesn't actually Mm. have huge implications. But what it does point to is just like a general self-centeredness about your own image. I, for one, have thought about this quite a lot because I used to work in the fashion industry. I used to post a shit ton of selfies and I don't do it anymore. And there are certain reasons for that, but I think the biggest reason that I don't do it anymore is because I think it's kind of reductive in a weird way, like putting your image out there and saying, oh, I look sexy in this image or I look hot or like I look funny in this image. Like, You're inviting I just, commentary, aren't you? When yeah, you post just, just a photo of yourself. You're inviting commentary. Yeah. And it's also saying like, this is my identity as it stands right now. And I don't think that that's like a true reflection of who we are at the end of the day, just trying to capture yourself in a photo. I do think that there are like questions to be had around this. I think that whether or not you engage in taking selfies too much, that can be a bit of a problem. But for the most part, I'm kind of just like, "Eh, fuck it. Take photos of yourself. Yeah, just do it. Who cares? Jessie, you like a thirsty (laughs) selfie? I just kept thinking about my late Irish grandmother and how I would have loved to send her this 30-minute Spotify (laughs) podcast of a 20-year-old examining whether her selfies are narcissistic and the definition of narcissism and not seeing at all the irony (laughs) of this entire activity. It was so so narcissistic. Such a good point. And I just went, I don't know if I'm getting old but post the selfie, don't, just please stop talking about it. (laughs) But then there was something really clever and meta about it because I think that it is a worry, especially of probably Gen Z's millennials, our own narcissism is a genuine concern we have that it's like, oh, shit, I think it all the time. I think I might be a narcissist. What I did find to be a really valid point she made was that I reckon the thirst trap selfie is out of fashion Mm. and that it's dated now. Can you explain a thirst trap for those who don't know what one is? So let's say seven or eight years ago and I was single and if I'd like done my makeup and stuff, I'd be like, I want to post a hot picture just to signify I'm like a peacock that's just got my tail out, right? Like I'm here, love me. And you would post a picture where, you know, like taken from a particular angle or whatever, and the aim was to appeal to the gaze of a potential suitor. <laughs> like, No, but, but it was also to have everybody then go fire emoji, fire yeah. emoji, you look so beautiful, you look so hot. Anyone who's in the orbit of a teenage girl will recognise that, that you post it and then there's the ritual of everybody then commenting about how beautiful and hot you are. Yes. But hopefully the suitor is in there posting fire emojis. That's the point, mm. you know? <laughs> so when Emma Chamberlain in her very long podcast broke down all the different reasons we post, one of them she said was, you know, if you're an influencer and it's your job, mm. another one is for what you said, if you are wanting to attract a potential mate or attract a potential friend or draw people into your orbit. She said another reason is as a form of creative self-expression. So if you express yourself through your makeup Mm -hmm. or you express yourself through your clothes or whatever, you do that. But I know that I have not ever felt comfortable posting static shots of myself unless it's in a context. But if it's just, here's just me, I always have to have a reason and it has to be kind of more than here I am celebrating women in science. And I'm not saying this to make myself sound better than people who post selfies for other reasons, but I'm much more comfortable with videos where I'm talking because to me, back to the reductive thing, I do find it really reductive to just say, here is my appearance. So why am I sharing this? I don't monetize my social media, so it's not for that. Why am I just sharing a photo of myself? Is it 
pride that I like how I look today? And why does the thought of that make me feel so uncomfortable? People now, and this is what I reckon the evolution has brought us to, you now need a why. The why of the selfie can be sort of an afterthought. And I've seen friends, and I've done this too, the time that is spent, it's like there is a hot photo of me and I'm like, okay, I need this on the (laughs) internet because I look hot. What I need is a caption that makes it look like there's a reason other than how hot I look that justifies the posting of this picture. And it's, I'm hot, but I'm smart and I'm thoughtful. And yes. I'll respect that yeah. in the caption. Exactly. As well. Like <laughs> International Women's Day, Women Power, or something. And it's you in a G string. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if this is also the girls with irrelevant captions effect, which is a viral Instagram account. People would find girls who clearly were in the predicament I was in, which is here's a great photo of me. I need a caption. And it would be like STEM, women in science. And they, take the piss. I guess men have it too. Like if if a man posted a selfie with absolutely no context, that would also be a little bit cringe. I I know guys who do do that. I know guys who really love posting a selfie of themselves. There's one journalist, Ronan Farrow, who's a brilliant journalist. He did a lot of the investigative reporting around Harvey Weinstein and other things. He does post a pouty photo, the, yeah, doesn't he? He's the son of Mia Farrow, but he loves himself sick and he posts these <laughs> like hot He's very attractive. He's got these gorgeous lips on him. He's shameless about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somehow, like, I'm always looking at it and go, wow, you are so confident that you can just, he doesn't have to find a hashtag STEM reason (laughs) to post a hot selfie. I think that actually, funnily enough, draws back to something that I was just thinking about, which was when you said that like the biggest sin for Australian women is to be vain, right? I think that maybe that's what we're trying to do, obviously, with the captions is kind of like belay ourselves from that vanity and say like, oh, but I'm not actually being vain in this moment. Plausible deniability. Yes, exactly. That's all we have time for today. And if you're missing us over the summer break, we are still releasing new episodes for subscribers. So if you're interested and want to join us, follow the link in the show notes. And a big thank you to all of our wonderful subscribers. We hope you're having a very happy new year so far. 